Hi, my name is Sharon Danks and I'm the Director of Green Schoolyards America and the Coordinator of the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative. Thank you so much for joining us today for the 28th meeting of the National Initiatives Community of Practice for Schools and Districts Moving Learning Outside. I'm so pleased to welcome Yalda Modaber to share her work with us today. Yalda is a former molecular immunologist with a background in child and developmental psychology, experimental psychology, and human biology. She spent the early part of her career in biomedical research and spent eight years at Harvard Medical School, first as a research associate and later as a graduate student. In 2000, Yalda changed career paths and became a consultant for startups, corporations, and nonprofit organizations as, as a strategist and evaluator. In 2005, Yalda posted an ad on a local listserv in Berkeley in search of Persian language immersion program for her firstborn son, Kian, who was then two years old. She received a response from another mother that led to a weekly parent play group and eventually became the school called Golestan Education. Yalda was hired as Golestan's first time, uh, full-time executive director in 2008 and is an active board member for several organizations in the education, human rights, and humanitarian sectors. Golestan School's award-winning program is centered on the child and emphasizes kindness and empathy, world cultures and global understanding, and interaction with and appreciation for the natural world. It's a model for schools across the United States and around the world. Golestan School reopened during the pandemic in June 2020 uh, for a summer camp program, and they stayed open for school the entire year. In, in her presentation, in a few moments, Yalda will tell us about um, what that experience was like and share the school's program and their amazing work. She's been an incredibly key collaborator for our national initiative this year and has been contributing her expertise in how to manage a school program that uses outdoor spaces in significant ways, uh, both long-term and in response to the pandemic. I wanna thank Yelda for all the time she spent with us this year and also thank her for the enormous amount of time she spent directly with school principals and district administrators in the Bay Area and across the country, helping them to adapt their programs for outdoor learning during the pandemic and beyond. I'm a great admirer of her work. Please join me in warmly welcoming Yalda Modan. We're gonna first talk about the school quickly and the collab work that we do with the way our organization is set up um, and then how we reopen and then what that means for our future. Um, this isn't, there we go. So this is a little a photo here of what our schools, our indoor outdoor classrooms in our school look like from inside. Uh, Golestan um, means garden of flowers. It's, um, we're an IB candidate school, an international baccalaureate candidate school in the Bay Area. Um, we have a, a, a focus on nature and immersing kids in nature and um, raising kind, caring, courageous individuals. And by immersing them in nature, both inside and outside, that supports this, this vision of, of where we want our kids to go in their lives and who we want them to become. Uh, we, we learn by doing. Um, most of us have learned more on the job than we have in school. So we're um, working on sort of breaking down what, what conventional school looks like. Um, and uh, we share everything that we do with others as a model so that we can hopefully create some positive change in the world of education and the world at large. Uh, we're like Karen was saying, we're established by a bunch of parents. We became an NGO right now. We, are, um, we have about 120 students. We're building up to fifth grade. We were for 10 years, a preschool and after school program and summer camp and received a lot of pressure from parents to expand into elementary. So we succumbed to pressure and expanded into elementary two and a half years ago as an international school with multiple languages. When we established, we were a Persian language immersion school and now we have um, both Persian language immersion and other languages. We, we moved from a small, beautiful campus in Berkeley to a much larger, uh, sad, <laughs> sort of traditional Catholic school campus that hadn't been updated since the 60s. And so we now have 20,000 square feet on nearly two acres, which is much, much smaller than Tony's district that we're going to hear about later, um, which is what enabled us to do the work that we do. We're small, we're nimble. It's easy for us to in implement the ideas that we have. Um, in 2016, we were selected as an Ashoka Changemaker School, and we were able to uh, collaborate with like-minded educators all over the world, and that's been wonderful. 
We've won a bunch of architectural awards for our new campus, and that's been awesome. My husband's our architect, actually, so it's been a fun collaboration. And we received our waiver to reopen for in-person instruction in California on September 5th of 2020. So we've been open sort of <laughs> as usual uh, for in-person all year. We only closed for smoke. We, were, we did not close for COVID um, once the new school year started, but we were closed in last March for two months we had distance learning. These are thanks to Sharon. She just <laughs> quickly, right before we hopped on here, shared these with me. These are our before and after photos. So it gives you a sense of what the campus looked like before here on the left. Um, basically, there was not a single tree on our campus. This is only half of our, it's less than half of our campus. Um, and then here is um, what we transformed it into. And a lot of the work that we do is working with other schools if they're interested in in transforming their campuses we just we go there and roll up our sleeves and brainstorm together and how to do it it's another before and after it's a different angle but you see the asphalt's getting pulled out and then what it looks like after so the collab when we established in um as a nonprofit in 2008 it, i wasn't interested in in running a, a small independent school for a bunch of privileged kids. That was not my my mission in life. And I, I'm happy to say that more than half of our kids are in, assist, are in tuition assistance. But I, I've always had sort of this sort of mission driven um, careers in my life. And so this was a, a natural extension of that. And it was so hard to found the school to start up a school from scratch that we decided that we as an organization would support other people wanting to do the same thing and that we would do it pro bono. The only thing that we would ask in return is that they pay it forward and support somebody else. And in, in the beginning, we thought we were doing this for um, schools that are um, focused on language immersion, but it turned out that people from all over the world were coming to see the school because it was different. Um, and so we basically, I, I show this sailboat because if we become this little nimble little sailboat that we, we go out and, and explore and, and find all these cool places and try them out and eat their fish and speak, try to learn their languages and come back and, and share it with these big, huge cruise ships that are, aren't as agile as we are. Um, it makes us a little tippier and a little more vulnerable, but it also enables us to try new things. And then we come back and we share and we're already starting to see a lot of change in these um, larger districts that um, ordinarily wouldn't be able to venture out that far. So the school supports a collab. Sorry, and the collab feeds into the school and there's this like a synergistic relationship between the two and it's quite seamless and works quite well. So we reopened in June of last year, actually almost a year ago, we reopened for preschool and summer camp. And that was one of the factors that actually enabled us to open safely. We were, we were very fortunate to have several factors in our favor. One is that we are small. Our class sizes were already small to begin with. We didn't really have to change anything in our preschool, for example, in terms of class size or space. All we had to change was to put a few fans in there, a couple of like processes that were a little bit different and uh, mask the kids and, um, and teachers and that we were back to normal. And uh, other, another, other factors were that this reopening for the preschool in the summer camp was basically a pilot for reopening the school in the fall. So we got to work through all the kinks together before we reopened for the entire community. And that was, was really very, very helpful. Um, we got to test our protocol. We had um, a case of COVID among our staff early on in July. And she was on our campus every day in contact with every surface and, and pretty much every person at the school. And she didn't pass it on to anybody. So she really tested our protocol for us. And we were very grateful to her for that. Thankfully, she didn't get sick. She was asymptomatic, um, an unexpected um, gift that she gave us. A lot, are we put together a task force very quickly. We have, we were also another um, factor that we were fortunate to have is that we had um, a COVID expert, a national COVID expert is one of our founding parents. And so he led our task force in making a lot of these decisions um, when we knew so little about the virus. Um, he knew more than most people in the world. So that was very, very helpful. 
And the design of our space also helped, as you saw in some of the photos, the indoor outdoor classroom. So we just opened our doors and put some fans in and that made it easy for us. And we had lots of open space outside that we hadn't developed yet. So we were able to set up outdoor classrooms there. So a lot of the photos that you're gonna see, these aren't very different than what our school looked like before COVID. The only difference are the masks. Um, otherwise it wasn't very different. Um, and so you'll see that we, you know, we have fire, the kids are getting muddy and they're this um, pretty much most of the photos that you're gonna see, they're pretty active in their photos. Um, this is a um, video of our preschoolers in the playground that is filled with loose parts and no conventional um, play structure. And you can see how they interact with their space here. So summer of 2020, some of you have seen some of these photos. I, I know Sharon has used them. Um, this is what our outdoor classrooms looked like last June and July, um, thanks to a bunch of parent volunteers that helped us set up some yurts and, and these shades. We um, got our kids out sitting on hay bales. They were pounded by the sun. It was pretty miserable, actually. They were having a hard time by the end of the summer. They were ready to think of new things. And by the end of summer is when we were able to bring in um, more um, uh, canopies. But then in the autumn, we here in California have this new season. So we don't have four seasons, we have five seasons. So we have fire season. And this is one particular day where the air quality didn't require us to close. We could stay open because the air quality was, was um, tolerable. It was probably at like 80, um, but it was pitch black. And so this is like at 10 a.m. the kids with their um, camping lights. Um, it was an epic day. And then in the winter things were, we were, we have great weather here in Northern California. We had some crazy windstorms in, in this winter that I've never experienced after 20 years of living here. It just happened to happen this year. Um, so those were really, really challenging. We lost canopies. They were blown over like 50 feet, um, massive canopies. So we've been through, um, I think maybe four sets of canopies at this point, but we found the right one um, that we're really happy with now. And hopefully knock on wood, that'll last us a little while because we intend on continuing to use them. This is what it looked like in the winter. Not always. I love that. And it's amazing how, how resilient. And we want them to experience some hardship. So we make things a little hard for them, right? So their play structures are pretty heavy to, and they have to build them themselves. They have to work a little bit harder, but what doesn't, I think these are, these are, they develop great skills and tenacity as a result. And they also have a lot of fun, lots and lots of fun.
and child labor in the farm. This farm sources our kitchen, not to the extent of the district that we're gonna hear about after this talk, um, but we are inspired by it. We, we strive to reach that point. Um, this is something I'm really excited about. This photo is a really terrible, not a really attractive photo, but um, I'm sharing this because, actually Sharon, I don't know if you know about this, but our, our uh, we have an aquaponic farm system. This was when it was being built, but it's now completed. So there are these tanks that contain trout and on top they're growing lettuce um, and they, they grow about 20 to 30 pounds of lettuce a week. They're designed to grow that much. We're not there yet. And that's how much we go through at the school. So um, we're looking forward to harvesting lettuce to bring to the kitchen from this aquaponic farm system. Okay, so it's not all fun and games. We are actually educating these children. Not to say that those other experiences aren't educational, but what we do is we just, uh, we have these eight week units and we integrate everything into it. And it often, well, it always integrates some aspect of nature and their experience and what they're experiencing there or um, in our, our current environment or the world at large. <clears throat> Here is um, a unit that they just, they're wrapping up an eight week unit on the rainforest. It's a K-1 class and they're learning about um, different qu qualities of leaves and how little air bubbles stick on the leaves. Here they're making paper um, and here they're doing a model of the rainforest. Our preschoolers were learning about ants when they wrapped up a unit on the Silk Road and they're learning about societies and ants and bees and how similar they are to human societies and how different they are. So here are the bees here. I think they're making a model of a bee, but as you can see, it's all hands-on and you have these indoor outdoor spaces. So they're never really cooped up inside even before COVID. This was just their, their way of being. So here are just a list of the things that our teachers shared about their expect their their experience working outside. They said it was really, I mean, it was brutal. It was hard. I mean, even though our weather is is moderate, it's still very challenging to be out in the wind, especially. The wind was the hardest and the rain um, for a full day without any respite, without being able to go inside. Um, but it brought everybody much, much closer to each other. And then moving forward, this is like, please reach out. If there's anything that we can do to help you think through whatever obstacles may be in your way, we may not have all the answers, but we know where to um, reach out and find them often. Sharon is one of them, but don't hold back. And, and yeah, we, we are very passionate about this work and we're collaborating with other people as much as possible. No problem. We have, we have a couple more minutes. So do you want to go just to add? to talk about questions? Yeah, I think so. Let me see. Okay. Is the school exempt from state curriculum standards? You create your own curriculum? Yes, yes. Though we are an IB, we follow the IB curriculum, curriculum but yes, we do. Yeah. And then is it, a, is it a year round school? It is not, it is not. I've, I've, it is for preschool, but not for elementary. Okay. And I propose it, but there's, no one's on the same page about that. Yeah. <laughs> Great, and then there's a few folks that you might want to follow up with individually, like, can we come for a visit? Those types of questions, so. Absolutely, open door policy. Even during COVID, we had an open door policy. <clears throat> That's the whole purpose of the school. It's a model that we, we created to share. Great, okay. Thank you so much, Elda. Thank really you appreciate you sharing your work and it's so inspiring to see and, and we in Yalda, there's a case study of Golestan's work on our website. It was put up right when we were starting and I think we were gonna do some additions to it and we'll have um, a recording of this to, to add to that soon. So thank you so much uh, for, for joining us and for all the work that you've done with the initiative this year. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for your great work.